coconut oil on the beach, a Mai Tai at Tommy Bahamas, the smoky smell post fire, steak at Mastro Steakhouse, and the perfume on his wife's neck. Today in studio, I have president of the Professional Firefighters Association of Arizona, Captain Brian Jeffries. Welcome, and please introduce yourself. It is my pleasure. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for bringing out all the things that I love so very much. Get ready for the real estate show that takes you across the barriers and into the danger zone. That bitch in real estate podcast with your host, Tenacious T. Yes, these are a few of your favorite smells. That's right. And as I was reading through the favorite smells description, I'm like, this sounds like a hot date. <laughs> so, you have just finished putting out a fire and you're mm -hmm. still lingering in that smoky smell. Mm -hmm. And you arrive at the beach where your wife is waiting <laughs> with a steak from Mastro Steakhouse and a Mai Tai cocktail. Mm -hmm. And you lean over and she smells like coconut oil. <laughs> Does that sum it up for you? <laughs> you nailed it. Right <laughs> yes, on the I beach, did. Cabo San Lucas, here we are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you all noticed the radio voice that this man has? <laughs> It is definitely a very white feel. So not only do we have the magnificent date with your wife, but <laughs> please lean in, lean in and say a few words in your radio voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank God I have a radio voice because I certainly have a face for it. Uh, <laughs> and thank goes. God I have a beautiful wife that tolerates it and yeah. my other hijinks. But it is, uh, it's a lot of fun. Yes. Isn't that great? Don't you love that voice? <laughs> mm. that, is, uh, that is what we call smooth like silk. Yes. <laughs> Now, speaking of your wife, Lynn, mm -hmm. Lynn Jeffries, yes. she has been in your life for quite some time and have been by your side, which we're going to get more into that story. Mm -hmm. But there's also another young lady in, in your life. Yes. And please tell us about her. Certainly. So um, let's see, uh, 17 years ago, 18 years ago, in a month from almost uh, today, uh, this little girl came into the world and was never expected to survive. Mm. Uh, she may still hold the record. It's got still north for the longest preemie that oh. uh, they had ever had. 2.6 was all she weighed. Oh, my goodness. She was in that incubator for months. We were there every day to visit. And she is our niece. She is Lynn's brother's daughter. Mm -hmm. And um, she's had a little bit of a rocky road. No, a lot of a rocky road yeah. over the years uh, with uh, her upbringing. And that's a story probably for another day. Yes. But um, uh, almost three years ago, she came into our lives. We brought her into our lives with open arms. And the day we got the phone call that she needed help, we went and picked her up, flew across the country to get her, brought her home. And she has just been making us smile ever since. We, it was, we enrolled her into my alma mater high school, uh, Horizon. <laughs> yes. And uh, she has been nothing but a treasure to us ever yeah. since. And uh, we are her now her legal guardians. Wonderful. And we're, all we're doing is looking to the future. And that's what we talk about every day is yes. there's a reason why windshields are much larger than rear view mirrors. And that's how we're living. Oh, God, how beautiful is that? <laughs> There's a reason why windshields are larger than rear view mirrors. That's Looking right. forward, living in the present moment. That is beautiful. So that is your little family. That's right. That is, that is what you do as well. You serve. You have lived to serve. And if I can refer to my cheat sheet, <clears throat> you have been in the uh, position of legislative chairman for reform and aid to firefighters injured in the line of duty and expansion of recognition of certain cancers mm -hmm. for firefighters. Yes. Along with that, so just so you know, not just a average firefighter going in there, not that there's anything wrong with that in representing all of our guys and gals, but you have been highly educated. Phoenix University, George Washington University, Harvard University, and the University of Baltimore. So when you stepped up and you took position in this leadership field in order to find recognition, the education must have came into play. And did that help you get recognition for what you're doing? So I'm a school junkie. <laughs> uh, it, it actually feels strange the last few years not being in some form of school. Uh, I just, I love the compliment of being in work life, in personal life, and being in school life, and, and not going at one of them all at once. So mm -hmm. 
to answer your question, yes. I, what I sort of did along the way is as I found this journey that I was on was going to be the life commitment that I was going to make mm -hmm. was that my life was going to consist of getting on a truck and going out and helping the public getting off the truck and spending every day off helping my brother and sister firefighters. I knew it f over 20 years ago that that was going to be my life commitment. And so I decided as I continued through my school career that I wanted everything to complement what it was I was working on. And that has been nothing but true. And yes, it has enhanced my abilities uh, quite a bit to play in in roles that, you know, they don't teach you in the fire academy. They don't no. teach you how to pass a law. They don't right. teach you how to lobby a legislator or a congressperson or and, you know, it's they're two vastly different worlds because yes. in one world you get to go there, put out the fire, help a person with a heart attack, cut somebody out of a car, and then it's over and you're back to the station. Mm -hmm. This other world is mired in bureaucracy and <laughs> yes. baloney and yes. politics <laughs> and relationships and backstabbing and all these other things. Yes. But but it's been a lot of fun along the way. I've I, it's allowed me to do things I never. I've met presidents of the United States. Yeah. I've made good friends with unbelievable leaders. Um, I've been in a Marine Corps uh, uh, leadership program where I get to fly in an Osprey. Ooh, I mean, just ooh, you, yeah. the list goes on and on. And all of these have nothing to do with me. They have everything to do with being a firefighter yeah. and just getting in, being lucky enough and honored enough that the fellows and the gals let me represent them. Yes. And um, But yes, I'm, I've loved the schooling. It's complemented things very, very well. My, my graduate studies were in law. And specifically the history of law and how we get laws passed and how yes. we get things accomplished through the bureaucracy of government. And oh my God, has that served me well. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, again, drawing back on the connection with family, mm -hmm. obviously being in the fire department, that is an extension of your family. It is family. And you have such commitment, commitment and dedication that you started off actually as a president in the local, was it Mesa That's chapter? That's correct, yes. And how did that affect why you ended up stepping up into the legislative position in order to, let's say, battle mm -hmm. for more coverage and recognition for firefighters? You touched on something very important, which is that my family life has so interlaced with my fire family life, it's been monumental to mm -hmm. me. My, you know, Lynn and I were holding hands in middle school. That's how far oh, back we go. Oh my goodness. And, you know, her father, uh, my father-in-law, uh, at the time worked for the Phoenix Fire Department. Wow. And when I got out of high school, I had no idea what I was going to do with my life, going to college, trying to figure it all out. Took me for my first ride along, Phoenix Fire Station 41. I immediately fell in love. Yeah. As you know, I played football and baseball, loved the team environment, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. Well, he introduced me to this amazing guy named Gary Picari. God bless him. He is uh, He's no longer with us, mm -hmm. but he mentored me a great deal as to what it meant to not only be a firefighter on duty, but off duty, your commitment to the community, wow. commitment to your fellow firefighters. I made a commitment to him that if I were able to get hired, that I would always give back in as much as I could. Love it. So back to family again. Yes. Well, I grew up with as an only child. Mm -hmm. I had no brothers and sisters. And I, I think I've always been trying to fill that void in my life. <laughs> Adopting everyone in, <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, bringing Lacey in, but also my brothers and sisters on the job. I've de dedicated my life to them. Yes. Yeah, but they give me so much fulfillment in that way. They drive me crazy, but I love them. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so to your question, I when I got hired in Mesa, it was sort of one of the last places I thought I'd get hired. I, yeah. I didn't grow up in that part of the valley. Um, back then, Mesa was sort of isolated from mm -hmm. the Phoenix metro region, et cetera. But they called, and I went. Yeah. And um, when I got there, I recognized there was a lot of improvements that could be made. It was an amazing fire department, but I felt like the association could play a much larger role. Uh, there were some things that could really help the brothers and sisters in their both their personal and professional lives. Yes. So I immediately got engaged, and I got involved in some policies and Thankfully, somehow I figured out how to get these new policies passed. Yes. And within a few years, uh, that gained me a little bit of popularity. And next thing you know, I was the vice president. And then sooner thereafter, I was the president. Yeah. And I, again, learning along the way, going to school, as I mentioned, yes. it all just sort of fit together. And it was like the snowball for me and uh, for, every, for everybody I work for and serve. 
So there's a lot of people um, that want to be a part of the fire fire department mm. or a police department or get into a first responder position. And when they get into that position, they find that they have further interests. They want to serve further. This is where I think education is so key. And like you said, you're a school junkie. Mm -hmm. As you were finding ways to lobby and, and help the fire department, what mm -hmm. would you say you started to lean on more when it came to education because you kind of went in stages too. You you kept educating yourself That's further. Right. Where did you find that you started digging deeper and needing further education when it came to the legislation? Well, the first element that occurred to me was that I was having meetings with folks within the bureaucracy. You're talking about HR directors mm -hmm. and city managers and mayors and, you know, I was representing some of the hardest working, most dedicated people on the planet. Yeah. But in the reality of the world, many of those people I was representing have GEDs, mm -hmm. yet they're highly skilled, yes. highly technically educated. But when you're sitting across from someone with a master's degree, they look at uh, through a particular lens that says, if you don't have a master's degree, you should never make six figures. Correct. And, um, you know, having to deal with the realities of the world, one of the things that I really started promoting to my fellow firefighters, was, which was and is still not all that popular, is that you really should follow this path and at, and at least further your education either before and during mm -hmm. your, your professional career. Uh, it helps me advocate for you. But here's an even more important element to that. When you sign on to this profession, you put a badge on your chest that says, I'm taking an oath that I will do anything and everything for people around me and my in the greater good, no matter what the cost. Yes. Can we get an amen? <laughs> yes. It's beautiful. And that cost could be your life. Yeah. That cost could be a limb. That cost could be any variety of injuries that will mean you'll never do this job again. Yeah. Well, if you're a 35 year old man or woman, and you have devoted your entire career to learning everything there is to be a great firefighter, mm -hmm. paramedic, EMT, and you suddenly find yourself never able to do that job again, and you're sitting on a high school diploma, what are the chances of you having gainful employment moving forward? True. So I promote this heavily amongst our ranks. And for the first time in the last few years, we're starting to add educational requirements to promotional exams. Beautiful. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to have the city reimburse you for some education and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm a big believer. It helps me move the ball down the field on their behalf. It also helps protect them and their families if uh, terrible things happen. Yes. And then, um, you know, I, every time I get a chance, I also talk about my own story. You know, I, I didn't have this all figured out from the beginning. No, no. But if you have these different elements going on in your life, mm -hmm. I think we've all experienced this where – you sort of go down this path, not knowing where you're going, but you keep moving. And then, you know, these doors keep opening up for you. Yes. And in my case, it wasn't necessarily doors to advance my career. It was doors to advance my cause. Yes. And my cause are the people that have elected me to represent them. Yes. And, I, you know, I, you just, it's mind blowing sometimes how those you've opportunities had, happen. You've had a ripple effect is what you've done. You started off in a position of, becoming a firefighter, saw a greater need for advancement. Mm -hmm. And then you spread that awareness and it is having the ripple effect. I hear my husband is a Scottsdale firefighter, <laughs> actually first met you in Horizon High School. That's you right. were a freshman and yes. he was a senior. That's right. But even he talks today about how he's seeing more and more firefighters, young guys and gals coming onto the department with a higher education, wanting mm -hmm. to get further education, and also that the departments are assisting them in mm -hmm. that. So you've had a huge ripple effect. You were actually one of the names that he says initiated that happening in across our valley, across the fire department. So that is yeah. so beautiful. Your cause. Let's first talk about why you started to initiate in the legislation mm -hmm. for recognition of cancers that aren't covered and for further coverage when they're injured on a job. For certainly my whole career and most of all of our whole careers, in, instinctively we have known that as society advances, things around us are changing, that 
the things that we're exposed to in our profession mm -hmm. can do great harm to us. Yes. However, you know, it was always just in the backs of our minds. Mm -hmm. Well, as society has evolved, as the introduction of chemicals into our society has evolved radically yes. in you and I's lifetimes, we have quickly discovered that we now have an epidemic mm -hmm. running through our profession as a result of the smoke exposures, even ironically exposures of the um, chemicals that are put on other chemicals to, to try to yes. inhibit flammability. Mm -hmm. And ironically, even the some of the um, tools that we have, such as firefighting foam, yes. to try to help combat these fires, all have carcinogens in them. Yes. And the outfits that we wear, the protective equipment that we wear, mm -hmm. has not advanced hardly at all to a place to where it can protect us from this onslaught of chemicals. Yes, yes. And so what is happening uh, is are these silent killers are killing our people. Yeah. And we are getting cancer, at, like I said, just epidemic rates. Yes. Thankfully, um, the scientific community has stepped in and is looking at this and mm -hmm. has essentially proven what we had in the backs of our minds is now moving to the fronts of our minds, is that these chemicals have a profound effect. For example, Johns Hopkins University has done a variety of studies showing the cancer rates are through the roof. Yes. Right here in Arizona, U of A, fine folks down there, worked with the Tucson Fire Department. And as firefighters were exiting burning buildings, they were immediately taking buccal samples out of the cheeks, their cheeks of their yes. mouths, as well as urine samples to see what the levels of carcinogens in their bodies were. Yes. Even they even surpassed their expectations. The chemicals were so high and so saturated their bodies mm -hmm. that it, it it really surprised everyone. So, so a lot of people don't understand because they're thinking, well, they've got their full uniform on and they've mm -hmm. got the masks on and they've got their oxygen. They think it's oxygen tank, but it's really air that's blowing in, correct? It's the same air you yeah. and I are breathing yeah. right now. Right. Um, so they're just assuming that you're protected. Right. But they're not thinking about the skin. They're not thinking about the lingering chemicals that are still in the air. When you take your mask off or mm -hmm. when you're breathing the air in mm -hmm. that tank, can you expand a little further on why these these chemicals are just taking over and eradicating your, your normal cells? I can't say it much better than you just did. You <laughs> articulated that very well. The, the bottom line is that our equipment was never designed to keep out chemicals. Mm -hmm. That's not its purpose. Mm -hmm. Its purpose is to protect us from heat. The only advancements in our equipment over the last 30 years or so is that it allows us to fight fires in even much higher heat conditions, Gotcha. which is only more of a detriment to our bodies because mm -hmm. you're going into a fire that by in today's world where all the wood is saturated with resins and glues, mm -hmm. it all of the furnishings in a home or office are all made of chemicals. Um, even right down to the clothing we're wearing today are mostly made of chemicals. Yes. If you're wearing a golf shirt from Under Armour, a pair of Nike shoes, it's all plastics and resins, yep. et cetera. So when those things are burning, they burn much hotter. Mm -hmm. They burn much faster, and they give off all kinds of noxious chemicals, many of which we, we haven't even identified. Yes. And so as you go into this fire, you can go in there for a longer amount of time. You can be exposed for a longer amount yeah. of time. You can endure much more heat. Well, guess what happens when your body gets hotter? It The pores open, and it mm -hmm. absorbs chemicals at even a higher and faster rate. Yes. And so... All we're doing is making matters worse. Yeah. And so to the equipment, it allows us to deal with the heat. But I'll give you one example. Yes. We have a hood that we wear. It's called a Nomex hood. Mm -hmm. This was not developed in a laboratory. It wasn't some <laughs> special NASA-type project to help protect firefighters. Right. We stole it from NASCAR drivers. <laughs> it's, and it's really mostly a tube sock that we pull over our yeah, heads. Yeah. That, so that's how advanced you know, we are. <laughs> <It's tube socks. laughs> yes. We don't have the colored stripes like the old days. Yeah. But other than that, it's mostly... I mean, it's a little more advanced than that. Yeah. But in terms of protecting us from chemicals getting to these high-absorption places like our mm -hmm. necks and behind our ears and our wrists and our ankles and our groins. Yes. Those places are absorbing chemicals like crazy. And that's what was evidenced by U of A studies. Mm -hmm. You come out, swab your cheek, and oh my God, you're full of carcinogens. Can you name some of the cancers that seem to be more prevalent and are 
running rampant through the departments. Yes, number one, testicular. Mm -hmm. We have men, and we'll probably get into this in a moment, but mm -hmm. we have men at much, it's a young person, young man's uh, cancer, usually for men in their 20s and 30s. Yes. Today, we have tons of them getting it in their 40s and 50s and 60s. Uh, kidney cancer is another one. Those two in particular have been discovered to be a, a lot caused by the firefighting foams mm -hmm. uh, that we've been using and saturating ourselves in for years. Um, prostate, um, pancreas. Uh, we also have some abdominal cancers, mm -hmm. multiple myeloma, uh, and a few others. But there's a list of, of 8 to 12 that are, are, are serious offenders. And some of these are not, in general, covered by correct. insurance. That's correct. And this is why you have began lobbying for this coverage. That's right. And you also have a personal story when it comes to that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you... It's, I can't tell you how challenging it is to have a brother or sister suddenly find out that they're 35 years old and they're fighting for their lives for cancer. Mm -hmm. They have to tell their family. They have to have serious thoughts about what I mentioned earlier. Like, what if I can never come back to the yeah. job? What am I going to do? How am I going to pay the bills? Yes. Well, you're not supposed to be thinking about those things. You're supposed mm -hmm. to be thinking about getting better. Yes. And then to add insult to injury, when there is all this overwhelming evidence that you got this from your job, mm -hmm. if you had you worked in a cubicle, you likely would have never got this cancer. Right. And then the employers are in what we found to be literally a conspiracy with some of the insurance companies mm -hmm. to deny workers' comp claims for yes. these cancers. And what was crazy about it is you asked a lot earlier about, you know, education mm -hmm. and the law and, and, and dealing with politics. I mean, even before I arrived in this role, there were already some laws on the books that articulated that these particular, some of these particular cancers need to be covered. Yeah. But you get lawyers involved and you get um, unethical doctors involved. Yep. And we still had people that were fighting. And instead of going to your doctor to go find out how you're going to get better, you better call it, call an attorney, yeah. and I hope you've got about thirty grand sitting around just to get started yeah. to go help try to get this covered by your workers' compensation insurance. So they're serving their community, they're serving their family, they're putting their life on the line already, and then when they find out that their life is on the line, nobody's coming to bat for them. That's right. You you go through the process and you submit your claims, mm -hmm. and the bureaucracy begins. Yes, they're immediately denied. You ask for an independent, independent quote, end quote, um, examination, and then you go to see one of these doctors. And one of these doctors, as it's turned out, is being paid for by the insurance industry. Yeah. And then we started digging in and find out these doctors have denied every single claim and given evidence that no way in heck did you ever get it. And the question they ask when they go through this interview who, by the way, they may have never laid their hands on this patient. They right. may have never even gotten into their records. And their question is, can you explain, Mr. Firefighter, which fire and specifically which chemical caused your cancer? Wow. That's as preposterous mm -hmm. and offensive as I think you can yeah. get. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, because, and these are real life stories. Because it takes... It's not just one fire. Mm -hmm. It's years and years of dangerous exposure to the toxins that have caused the mutation and cancer to grow. And if you think about, we're all familiar with the recent California fires, mm -hmm. even the news said standing in California during these fires is like breathing in 22 packs of cigarettes a day. That's right. And that's just a natural fire mm -hmm. with trees and brush. Yes. So let's add in shirts and chemicals and glues and treated woods, breathing that in in just a couple of hours. That That is serious offense. And how can you name one fire that caused that particular cancer? It's their career. It's on the job. What I just heard you say... I can we switch roles? Because uh, I think I need to send you down the legislature. <laughs> I'm more I than happy to put a little tenacity in that. Yes, sir. I could not have said any better than you just said it. That's wonderful. Spot on. Yes. So, in your passion to find this coverage, which you have fought for for mm -hmm. years, it's it's almost like God gave you certain gifts and put you in a certain path so that you could lead this road 
to get the coverage for your brothers and sisters in the fire department. And then wham. So it was September of last year, uh, we were in the middle of the session and trying to get some improvements or enhancements to the laws that uh, are supposed to protect our people. Mm -hmm. um, over a long weekend, I was traveling to Colorado Springs because we go there every year to memorialize those that had passed in the year prior. Yes. It's, uh, it's, we have a wall of honor in Colorado Springs. It's a very special place to us. It oh. is a place we call home. And so I was there and honoring many members who had passed, not only from many of different on the line of duty deaths, but from cancer. Yes. And that's when I found, <clears throat> Uh, that's when I found that I had my own lump. Yeah. And um, so I, I, I came home on uh, on Sunday and I went to the doctor that week and mm -hmm. it turns out I had cancer. Yeah. And it's testicular cancer, which mm -hmm. is the number one cancer firefighters get. We have an over 200% chance above the average population. And of course, Repeat I'm, that, please. Of course. So yes. um, we as firefighters have an over 200% higher propensity for testicular cancer than the average man. That's and 200% that's right. higher. And... And I'm, you know, I'm turning 50 soon. And so I'm not in the average age category mm -hmm. to be getting this cancer. And so um, more bad news at the time is not only uh, did I have it, but it was, it was um, in my lymph nodes and mm -hmm. on its way to my brain. So not only did I have to go through immediate radical surgery, but I had to instantly get my butt into Mayo Clinic and get going with chemotherapy. Yes. So this didn't kill me. And uh, the good news, the doctor said, well, I've got good news and bad news. And he said, I'm going to have to almost kill you. Mm -hmm. But he goes, I may be able to cure you. Yeah. And my wife fell out of her chair <laughs> almost. Yeah. Uh, and I started going five days a week, five hours a day for yeah. chemotherapy. And, uh, you know, that, talk about life changing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, we all have a heart for people that go through those type of difficult times. Yeah. but. Going through it, it has changed me forever. Mm -hmm. And, but I, so far, I, I'm I'm doing well. And so let me just take you back to a couple of your hardest worst treatments. And mm -hmm. you don't. We don't have to talk about the details or anything. But for those out there who are faced with this, who have just been diagnosed, and who are terrified of these treatments. Mm -hmm. Is there one thing that you did either before or after that was like, I can make this, I can do this? Or was it as little as your wife holding your hand? All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think one of the things that I reflected upon as I went down this journey is I, I realized that there's a lot of people that walked down this road before I did. Mm -hmm. And some of them have made it. Yeah. And so if anyone's going to make it, I'm going to make it. Yeah. I have spent my life being dedicated to taking care of my body and my mind and, mm -hmm. and being as healthy as possible. And I'm relatively young. And so I'm a good candidate to, to be successful. And yeah. I, I kept that attitude throughout the whole thing. And, and I, I know it sounds cliche sometimes, but it is so true this, that that attitude is everything. Yes. I would, I, instead of just laying there while the they dumped those chemicals into me mm -hmm. through my port, I would get up and I would walk around and I would make fun of the nurses and they'd make fun of me <laughs> and I'd get my steps in every day. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? If I just walk around this place, dragging my pole, wearing my fire department hat, <laughs> I, I'm going to get through this son of a gun. And then when I'd get really tired or I'd feel like hell, yeah. I'd go sit down again and that's when my wife would hold my hand. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she retired through this journey. Mm -hmm. She did, she did dedicate herself full time to me yeah. and, um, life changing stuff. Yeah. You know, it's, it's beautiful. It's in a way it's like you have this magnificent love story, but you were able to totally fall in love with each other again in a different way, but in a stronger way mm -hmm. that has when I see the two of you together, it's mm. almost like you're just kind of glowing and floating along <laughs> because you have come to the other side of this horrific battle mm. 
that lasted for months and months and did tear down your body, like you said, almost to the brink of death. Mm -hmm. So you've gone through all of your treatments and you've, you've come up on your last treatment. Mm -hmm. Obviously along the way, you're seeing improvements. They're, they're seeing that the cancer is shrinking, so mm -hmm. to speak, and you get to your last treatment. What did that feel like? And what did your guys and gals do for you at the department? <laughs> I, so hundred hours of chemo <laughs> in 80, in 84 days. Wow. And I, uh, I was waiting, you know, the, the fi literally the watching the final drips mm -hmm. on my final treatment and just looking at the clock. And of course, in walks a crew from the Mesa Fire Department yeah. and my wife and Lacey, and they threw a little party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So outside, there's a fire truck waiting for me and uh, to take me home. Yeah. And so <laughs> it's it's so magical to me. All the things I've told you in this interview about how this whole thing interlaces in my life mm -hmm. and my family, both my fire family and my personal family, it's, it's, it, it just r made me realize and showed me how worth it it's all been. Yes. Yes. Because it's Absolutely. so gosh darn special. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's all been so very worth it. And none of it has anything to do with money. Nope. None of it has anything to do with um, any kind of material things in life. There's no agenda. It's about deep relationships and commitments to one another. Yeah, yeah. And right now, 2020, pandemic, mm -hmm. you name it, flying pigs, that's next. <laughs> when it all comes down to it, that is all that, and I'll bleep this out, that is all <laughs> matters. <laughs> Hallelujah to that. It is the relationship that you have mm -hmm. with yourself mm -hmm. and with your family and brothers and sisters that you work with on a daily basis. That's right. So you've got your final treatment. Mm -hmm. you've, you've gone home in the fire truck. <laughs> <laughs> and so you have one more visit though, mm -hmm. right? You, one more visit to verify that you are in remission. You go to that visit mm -hmm. and he gives you the news that you're in remission, correct? That's correct. Yes, you are, as of today, you're cancer free. And how did that feel? You know, that day was obviously very special. Yeah. Duh. Yeah, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> but what was even more special was that I, I walked out of there because I expected nothing less. Mm -hmm. And I walked out of there with a commitment that starting today, every day is going to get better and I'm going to build this body back and I'm going to get my head back in the game. Yeah. And and weeks after that, I got to walk up the back ramp again <laughs> and put my gear back on that truck. Yep. And despite a lot of protests from my family, <laughs> they were not ready for me to ever get back on that truck right. again. Right. But that's not how I'm going out. Right. No way. That means cancer wins. And so that day was one of the best days of my entire life. So you're back on the truck? Yeah. The date that you got back on the truck, share that with us. Uh, it's been six weeks ago this six week. Six weeks ago this week. Yeah. yeah. Back on the trucks, folks. Yeah. And what is so important about everything you just said, from the moment you got the diagnosis to sitting right here today saying that you're back on the truck, is the entire time mentally you focused on not giving up the mental focus and the mental commitment is our program it is our computer and if you sit there on a daily basis and say that you're not giving up your body feels that mm -hmm. and that is key and it's so important and that's also the ripple effect that you've had in your career in the department and being able to get back on the truck, not only for yourself, but what it's done for the entire community and hopefully what it's doing for those listening now who will not give up if they should have a diagnosis. I had a lot of our folks, and I mean a lot of them, reach out to me in one way, shape, or another. And they said, my diagnosis really rocked them. Yeah. I'm nobody special, but I'm in this role 
and the role is is special. It's mm-hmm. not about me, but it you know they'd they'd hear about some guy or gal in Glendale or Tempe or Peoria, whatever, but. It's like the president of the organization has it now. This is real. Yes. And 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 it bothers me to a degree that there are literally firefighters out there who are going to retire early because of me. They've told me that. Yeah. After what happened to me, they're like, you know what? This has opened my eyes. I feel like I need less time in this career. And that is bothersome. But the flip side of that, that I feel so it is so important now is that I'm going to look at every one of them when they if when some of them get diagnosed and say you're firefighter tough. Yeah. You can do this. Get your head in on straight. <laughs> this is something you're going to get through. I did it. You're yes. going to do it. Commit to it and let's get through this together, brother yeah. or sister. And and that is what I want to take from this moving forward. Yeah. Is that I can't stop this from happening you know, to everybody, mm-hmm. we, that bell is going to go off and we got to answer the call, Yeah. but by God, we can get through it. We can commit to it. And, uh, you know, you said it best. You've got to have that mind yep. body connection to remain positive and just get after it and say, I'm not going to lose this fight to overcome, to overcome, to find those bubbles of joy and hold on to them. Perfectly said. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. Um, so there's a little uh, award being given to you from the Scottsdale Firefighters Local 5050 at their big annual dinner coming up. It is the CARE Award. It is Contributing to Achievement and Redefining Excellence. I'm really excited, number one, to be there to see you get it. But it was the actual firefighters dinner, the Scottsdale Firefighters dinner that I met you at for the first time. I remember it well. And for me, this is like so special to be able to have you on my show and then see you receive this award. And you're such a humble guy. So I know this is hard for you to be like, oh, gosh, I'm, I'm getting another award because you've won quite a few. But this one's different. This one's special because not only are you continuing the legislation to fight this battle and get more recognition and coverage for our fire departments, but they are recognizing you for being a survivor of cancer. How does it feel? <laughs> I always look at something like this is this is has zero to do with brian jeffries <laughs> but it has everything to do with our family yeah and i think i i'm humbled and i'm incredibly honored they're going to give me this award but the honor the honor is really about all of us it's yeah. honor it's all of our honor mm-hmm. it's about this is who we are Yes. Any one of us, I always say, regardless of the color of the fire truck, regardless of what Mm -hmm. it says on the back of your shirt, we are one family. Yep. And we're going to get through stuff together, Mm -hmm. regardless of what anybody or anything throws at us. Yeah. So to me, that's what the award is about. Yeah. And it'll be for everybody. But I must say, I am very, (laughs) I'm so particularly, you know, honored and, and particularly thrilled, you know. I went to high school with what feels like almost half the Scottsdale yes, Fire Department. Exactly. And, and it, it's such a special thing because a lot of us got our start in the fire service working in Carefree and Cave Creek and Scottsdale mm-hmm. and for the Rural Metro Fire Department. Yep. The existence today of the Scottsdale Fire Department to those of us that are involved is a very, very special story. Yep. That's all we could spend a whole other episode <laughs> talking about that. But the, the, a lot of the folks in that department that made that happen you know, if for those of us that care, we'll go down in the annals of history of doing some of the most important work yes. in the history of the world mm-hmm. fire service. Mm-hmm. That is not an overstatement. What they have done, a lot of Scottsdale people that are living their lives and driving around in their cars every day, living in their homes, have no idea what they did to improve the lives yep. of Scottsdale citizens and beyond. And and they'll always have us a very special place in my heart for yeah. that. And and then, of course, the fact that I grew up with half of them, too. <laughs> I just love them to death. And it's so cool that I, I'm just glad I get to go have a drink with yeah. them. You know? <laughs> and, and like it or not, again, you're humble, but you are a legend now. And, oh, and and it's true. You are a legend, and I, I, I I'm going to legend Captain Brian <laughs> oh, Jeffries. <brother. laughs> oh, it's getting thick in here now. But. Legendary, indeed. Stay tuned for part two, Captain Brian Jeffries, and the famous questions. <laughs> <laughs>